Welcome to the Indigo Podcast, an exploration of human flourishing at work and beyond. I'm Ben Barron of Indigo Anchor and Cleveland State University. And I'm Chris Everett of Indigo Anchor. For more information, please visit us at www.indigopodcast.com. Hey, Chris, what are you wearing? <laughs> well, <laughs> well, Ben, <laughs> I thought you'd never ask. <laughs> uh, I'm working from home, so. Yeah, yeah me too. I think a lot of people are. Uh, yeah, so today we're going to talk about working from home, and in particular, how working from home has caused so many of us to have this just full-on collision between our personal and our professional lives. You know, this is the the kid running in behind you while you're on your Zoom call, uh, you know, bouncing between meetings and trying to maintain stuff around the house. All of that, because so many more of us right now are working from home, it just seems like this idea of the perfect you is kind of getting punctured. And so... We thought we'd have an episode about that. Yeah, it you know that this puncturing of the perfect illusion. Mm-hmm. So you spend all this time at work, or at least I see this all the time. Uh, you curate this vision of you as a person at at work, right? You know, you're all buttoned up. You're going to meetings. You're level setting the silos. <laughs> <laughs> And now you're just crying because your kid can't stay self-motivated on their homework. <laughs> so you can have a 10-minute sync call, right? <laughs> right. Right. So today today on the podcast, we're going to talk about what is uh, private versus professional persona, um, how this is potentially helpful and potentially harmful in the workplace, and some tips for how to best navigate between that private and professional persona and space. That's right. And this has to do a lot of what with what we call in the academic liter- literature impression management. And uh, so let, let's launch into this, this idea of what is a private versus a professional persona. And I, I think the first thing we, we kind of uh, can think about is, you know, how does this presentation, how do we appear to others how does this factor into life and success? And, uh, you know, a big aspect here is that we are always, uh, in some way or another, presenting ourselves in a performance, right? Um, and, and this is actually what we call, like, the, the dramaturgical aspects of, of life, right? And, and living in organizations and working and so forth. Um, and there's a bit of drama that we, we all kind of manage to some degree, uh, with each other and at work. And that certainly factors into how we present ourselves uh, in the workplace. And that's not all bad, but uh, well, what does that kind of look like, though? Well, you know, I always think about early in my career, right? <laughs> and, you know, you're sitting in the cubicle farm, and, and they wanted to be quasi-open space, so these are lower cubicles, right? By the way, can, I, can then, I just interject? I'm just so glad that I hope this open space nonsense, this fad, is going to be dead for good now that we have uh, coronavirus. Maybe that's the only good thing that's going to come out of this. <laughs> you know? <laughs> it was like, well, I don't know. It, it, it could break up the Facebook surfing for the uh, junior workers that aren't well utilized. True, so. true. <laughs> Sorry, I digress. Yes. So you're stuck so, there in this cubicle. You're, you're in there, and so you can work, and, you know, it's maybe four inches above the edge of your laptop screen. The elevator opens, and out out they come. The corporates, mm-hmm. right? Man, they've got a banging suit on. Everybody's super professional. Heck, they even have a form of the model walk, you know? <laughs> They're on the, on the catwalk. Yeah, if you know what I mean, you know? And... <laughs> <laughs> and and everybody's just like you can hear the clicking slow down click 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 oh, oh there they are mm. wow the corporates <laughs> they're going into a meeting to talk about our lives right <laughs> and and right they've got a persona yeah. they got a swagger they got an outfit you right. know they've even got their same lame jokes right <laughs> uh, <laughs> and and everybody's like well well, gee, I really want to move up in this company because these norms, these persona norms of, you know, there's like the IT guy or gal. Um, there's the accounting person, mm-hmm. 
there's the software developer. There's all these types of things. And, you know, you could almost do, and they do, they do television series right. about yeah, I just I was just thinking and, about like, like episodes of The Office, right? I mean, these are kind of those, uh, those uh, taken to a, a absurdity, those stereotypes, you know, you got the, uh, you know, the Michael Scott who's running the show and he's got his whole like persona thing that he's, he's presenting and, and everything else. Yeah. So it, if you want to move up, you're like, well, maybe, I, you know, people say dress the part mm-hmm. you want to be. So this is even like inculcated into our lexicon of, you know, how to be in the world. A lot of this stuff's not data driven, but you also find executives that are like, oh, how's my and that they have this thing like executive presence mm-hmm. coaching. <laughs> right, right. And, and well, and a lot of it has to do with, I mean, these, and these things certainly vary by organization. And, and a lot of it has to do with kind of the norms and the culture of the organization. So, you know, some places are, you know, there's kind of, um, you know, the, the, the more buttoned up and wearing a suit type thing is, is what's expected. Uh, that's becoming less and less common, I think. But, um, you know, others, there's other types of norms. But you think about, you know, if you're going to a job interview, there are certain expectations. And you can think of this kind of as a little bit of a, of a theatrical performance. And we, we're, we, we take these for granted because we're so used to them and we're trained on them and we talk about them. And, and, and you know, we go in and we, we try to present our best version of ourselves and we are more careful about what we say. And we, we try to appear in a certain way in terms of how we dress and how we do our hair and all of that kind of uh, external appearance and presentation types of, of matters. Um, and, you know, I, I think um, we're, we're kind of making fun of all of that. However, uh, you know, it, impression management is, is real. It, it goes on all the time. I mean, we are always, to some degree, right, um, managing our impressions a little bit with each other. Uh, and, it, you know, just kind of as we go through daily life. You know, if we if we always went through life telling exactly everyone around us exactly what we feel at the moment, exactly, you know, what we feel about them in the moment probably wouldn't go over so well. Right. Um, you know, <laughs> when, when I was like, we're, it would be awesome for like 10 minutes. Right, yeah, just, just to let loose. And sometimes it, that does happen. You know, we we just kind of. Uh, you know, like I say, we're frustrated with the situation or something. Um, you know, I, I was I was mentioning to you yesterday when my my almost five year old, like, you know, did, did the knife hand at me and said, you are not part of this conversation when I when she was all upset about something and talking to my wife. It was, it was just hilarious. Right. Oh, um, my God. You know, so you, we all kind of control ourselves and that that's a good thing. Um, but But I think there's this other part of it that you and I and, and I mean, we have the luxury of not of being in situations where we don't necessarily always have to do this, right? If you're in a corporate job, then this is a much more ongoing thing that you're probably not even going to notice after a little while. Um, but, and it's easy. Yeah. It's easy. Cause you know, all life's a stage. Well, mm-hmm. your backstage is your house. You brush your teeth, yeah. you go potty in the morning, you know, all that kind of stuff. you look in the mirror. How do I look? Do I look good? All right. Then you get in your car and then you have like some time mm-hmm. or get, you know, the subway, whatever, you know, you have some time to collect your thoughts and be prepared to go on stage. Then you enter your place of work and then you can perform. Right. But then what do you do? You hit that car. You maybe loosen the tie up. Right. Mm-hmm. Um, or you grab a beer on your way home and then you got your home persona. But but in this environment right now. Everything is colliding mm-hmm. and and uh, just overlapping. So you can't curate as much as you would have normal. And, and I think there's some benefit to that because, uh, you know, if, if we start to see each other perhaps as real people, that can elevate our ability to relate, to have real conversations, to be more understanding of each other and so forth. Uh, but there's this other thing that you and I have seen many times with our consulting clients, and we can spot it, I mean, right away. Um, coming in as an outsider, right? Uh, it's easier to see these things sometimes. Uh, it's what we call posturing. Right? Yeah. <laughs> and, uh, you know, like well, you and I will come out with something that's like, wow, did you see the posturing in there? Uh, what do we mean when we say posturing? Well, this is when somebody's presenting themselves um, in a certain way. And, you know, it's inauthentic. Um, 
and that doesn't mean it's bad. Like everything shouldn't be like if I'm authentically really having a bad day and I'm hacked off at somebody like I probably shouldn't be my real self in that moment. Right. You know? Maybe just be like having a rough day. Uh, excuse me. Right. But th this is a presentation of self meant to impress others. And you're trying to demonstrate something like status, knowledge, skill or power. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I'm an avid student of jazz guitar. Well, of all guitar, actually. Um, and I still keep a couple students. Um, now, they'll take a lesson with me every other month or something. You know, mm -hmm. here's here's four hours worth of material to work on. You know, call me when you got it type thing. But when I have a new student, the students that I have are generally advanced. Um, that first couple lessons, they're really trying to present themselves in a certain way, mm. right? And it can take a few lessons before they just relax and can get okay with the mistakes and and the the struggle that is learning advanced aspects of an instrument, right? Mm -hmm. um, so they are posturing, and, and but then you'll see them kind of nervous. But I feel like I see that so that same kind of mentality in our corporate clients, our other small mid sized business clients. That when you're we're doing, let's say, an executive coaching moment, it can take a few times. So like, okay, let's peel apart that posturing mm -hmm. and let's see what's under the hood so we can really get to work uh, on those inner things. So there's less of a difference between that external posturing and the reality of who you are. That's right. That's right. And, you know, people oftentimes can... You can get away with this posturing for a little while within an organization, but, um, you know, you're probably lying to yourself if you think that you're always fooling everybody. <laughs> you know, people uh, are pretty good usually at picking up on some of these things. And, you know, if it's an inauthentic presentation of your knowledge and skill, for example, people are going to pick up on that and it's just going to damage your credibility. Um you know, but yeah, and one way they manage that at the most senior level is just from exposure. Mm -hmm. So I see lots of times where the CEO is cloistered behind a communication representative. And that can be super important for new CEOs. Um, maybe they will say something that's not, um, you know, like Elon Musk and his problems <laughs> about talking about his own stock prices. Well, yeah. you know, he knows better. Who knows if that's just a I don't know, PR <laughs> stunt. But you'll see one of the ways that people do this is by being separate. But I know that if you're on a mission in Afghanistan with a, you know, infantry platoon, you know, if you got a potty and a slit trench around, you know, 10 feet from the guy next to you, um, <laughs> that, that kind of distance and being able to main that per, maintain that persona isn't available to you. So you have to dial into different types of um, skills. Right. 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 And I think a big um, takeaway, and we'll, we'll touch on this probably a few times here, though, in the episode is, is it's very important to read the cultural and situational cues around you. Um, you know, we, we are not saying that it is a good idea to not manage your impressions. Um, you know, it, it is a good idea to try to be aware of how other people might be perceiving you, because if you can be aware of that, then you can, um, you know, better adapt to certain situations. Uh, you know, if, if I'm completely um, uh, unaware of how other people are perceiving me, I may come across as really rude in a situation. I may come across as uh, being very insensitive, um, or, or other types of, you know, misunderstandings can occur. Um, so I, I also think that when we think about this, um, private versus professional persona, there are some important, uh, just personal preferences here that, that come into play. Some people are just more personal in nature in, in, in such that they, uh, they don't want to, uh, share much about their, their personal life with colleagues. And, I mean, I think that that's okay too, right? Yeah, you know, I think about, so I did a big consulting engagement with an investment bank uh, out in New York. Mm -hmm. And and um, you, you had to be like suit on point, right? Especially if you're going to meet with anybody that was higher up in the org. Mm -hmm. Now I was working with the technology part of the organization. Everything was great, but every there was just a certain level. But now when I've gone over and dealt with some of the Silicon Valley people, you know, you've got 
<laughs> there's like a certain etiquette around wearing professional jeans. Mm -hmm. Right. <laughs> you know, it's like you can't just take the Levi's off the shelf. Right. <laughs> you got to. And then you have like a nice shoe that goes with it and like maybe even a, a, a professional T-shirt, you know. <laughs> and I, you know, earlier in my consulting career, it, you know, I don't know, maybe this person's too corporate to really understand my business needs. <laughs> and, you know, they had the same business needs and thing and you know as somebody who used to be a professional musician out of nashville i don't have a problem navigating those you know uniform codes as it were yeah i mean you um, you are completely capable of dressing like a slob if needed <laughs> slob <laughs> professional right <laughs> oh my gosh the days of the curly haired fro those you know those have now gone with age but um <laughs> but but there is, right? So different cultural and situational cues that you have to miss. And I always say, you know, to new consultants, new people, it's like, hey, this is the window into who you are. Like, make sure you clean your window so they don't just see the dirty window. They can kind of start to see your person. But, you know, I know it, at the investment bank, some of those people, you would not know who their family is or if they were married or if they had kids and i know they set up a um a shared service center in nashville and we're hiring a bunch of nashville people and it was funny to watch some of the interviews between the new york guys and um the nashville you know and then the starting of the work relationship. Like, oh well so are you married and have a family and the new york guy would be like like oh my god did you just ask me that <laughs> right <laughs> And that's just a per. I mean, there's nothing wrong knowing the person next to you has a wife and two kids, mm -hmm. or or a, a partner and an adopted kid, or whatever right. form of family they got. And so that's just personal preference. But that's kind of important in reading those cultural and situational cues on on how to be. That's right. That's right. And you know, I think it's also uh, an important thing to note in terms of how we present ourselves and the idea of impression management. Um, that, you know, most of us are, are, are at least well aware, I would assume, um, you know, we talk about how first impressions really matter. And the, the research does uh, tend to suggest that that's true. Um, you know, when we are first introduced to a group or another person, uh, you know, they're kind of an information seeking overload. They're trying to figure you out. And um, those first few moments and those first few interactions are fairly important. Uh, and so it is a good idea to try to be on your best behavior and try to present yourself the way that you want to be seen to the best that you can. Um, because then after you kind of have that first impression that's built up uh, in the minds of others, um, if you slip up or you do something that's kind of out of the ordinary, they're not going to really care too much. You're going to be like, oh, that is just kind of, you know, a slip up or whatever. Um, and uh, it, it's a little bit harder to recover from a bad first impression. So I think it is important to pay attention to these things, especially in the beginning of a relationship or beginning of, um, so, you know, your entry into an organization. Yeah, Ben. So let's talk about impression impression management um, from the review article in the nineteen ninety uh, psychology psychological bulletin. Yeah. So there. this is a uh, you know kind of one of those articles that gets cited a lot when uh, when people are writing about impression management, um, and we'll put a link to it in the show notes, and you can check that out if you're so inclined. And I think. Uh, you know, a couple takeaways just to help us understand and maybe have some shared vocabulary around impression management is um, thinking about it in terms of what, what's described in this article as the two components of impression management. And those two components are, number one, impression motivation. So, you know, how, um, what, are your, what are your motivations for even trying to manage your impression? What's the goal relevance? What are you trying to get out of you know, managing your impressions. Um, do you care about those those goals, right? What's it going to get you if this other person sees you as, uh, um, you know, professional or, or whatever, right? So take a, an interview, for example. I mean, you, you probably have a fairly, a fairly high um, value placed on making a good impression there because, you know, the the outcome could potentially be getting a job offer. And that is, I assume, something you value if you're looking for a job. Um, and then there's, you know, this this idea of the discrepancy between a desired and your current image. So let's say you're trying to uh, correct some sort of image that, that you think other people have of you. 
um, that can also be a motivator for managing your impressions and trying to uh, create a different image of yourself. So that's impression motivation. Yeah, and then the second component of impression management is impression construction and how we kind of put this stuff together. And it's just really interesting if you stop and kind of think about it. A lot of this has to do with how you view yourself, right? So your self-concept and who you want to be and your identity. Um, And is there a difference between kind of how you uh, really think you are and how you want to be seen? Um, you know, and, and one thing we'll talk about a little bit more, I believe, in this episode is, you know, if, if, if there's a difference between who you are and who you want to be, it's okay. And it's probably a good idea to try to be, try to act like the person you want to become, right? Um, right. And then another piece of this impression construction is uh, the, the constraints of your role. So, you know, I think about my role in the, my various roles that I play in the military, uh, my role as a professor. Um, there are certain things that I need to do to maintain um, a, a I, guess, I suppose, a professional or a, uh, an appropriate uh, impression in those times, right? If I'm overly casual, for example, with students or with subordinates in the military, um, that's just not a, <laughs> that is not a culturally or uh, professionally accepted way of behaving, and it can lead to some problems, right? Yeah, if you, if you got to go brief the chief of staff, you don't go, yo, sir, how's your morning happening? <laughs> That's not <laughs> like maybe after working with the guy for two years, you could get there. But <laughs> That's yeah. not your opener, right? <laughs> yeah. And if you are the chief of staff, you you probably should, uh, you know, be aware of how you're interacting with people, too. Right. Um, and not be overly casual and in, in invading their privacy and so forth. Um you know, so I, I think there's this so there's impression motivation. Why are you trying to manage your impression? And then how you put that together with regard to how you see yourself and how you fit into your role. Right. And, and a lot of this stuff, um, you know, everybody talks about bringing their authentic um, self to the workplace. Mm. And, and this is kind of where we move to some of the potentially helpful and potentially harmful aspects of this stuff um, in the workplace. So, one of the things that we learned from the LGBT community is, um, you know, the psychology of the closet, mm. not being able to be your authentic self around certain key elements of you, right? Mm-hmm. Um, and so when we look at the impression, motivation, you know, discrepancy between desired and current image, goal relevance, uh, self-concept, role constraints... We have these roles and cultures that emerge within organizations that kind of define what is acceptable or not. Sure. Right. So if you take somebody with an extreme Southern accent into a New York um, investment bank, well, you know, that might be off-putting. But does it matter what kind of accent somebody has? Not really. No. Yeah. And so like one of the things that's interesting about the closet in the LGBT community is like none of these things are harmful. Right. Mm-hmm. But there's a social stigma attached with some of these things. And so when we're at home doing our work, hello, you know, mm-hmm. I'm I'm Sarah Smith. And, you know, you're going through your presentation. You're maybe giving your team some work and then your same sex partner and two kids stroll in between the back and are making a bunch of noise and maybe are still in their pajamas at 2 PM. Oh, you know, you can have that kind of, Oh my gosh, uh, my, my two worlds are colliding and my curated image is crashing. And this is one of the ways that it could be really harmful because does it matter if you have a same sex partner and, and two kids that are still in their pajamas? Not really. Mm -hmm. But the question is, is that culture and that element of your work and and your office, how do they respond to that? And how are you curating those kinds of interactions? Right, right. You know, and I think it's just an interesting thought of, you know, curating the image that we present. And I think, you know, so many of us um, now are on social media, and that's a kind of a perfect storm of uh, curated self. You know, most of us don't post those pictures of our kids screaming at us. We post the cute ones, right? Or, you know, we don't we don't post about, uh, you know, at least most people don't um, 
things that are going really wrong in your life. And sometimes people do. And, you know, say like, you know, an illness that someone's having or, or something that went wrong. But we do have this kind of tendency uh, to, to, to present this one image of ourselves. And, uh, you know, I think that a lot of this is starting to collide as people are seeing, you know, us in our real selves working from home. Um, so I think we can talk a little bit now about how this impression management and how this kind of plays out in the workplace. And one um, really interesting area of research that's relevant here is actually the research on what we call emotional labor. Uh, and emotional labor is a it's a phrase that is oftentimes mis um, co opted uh, yeah. for <laughs> what it's not about. Yeah, it's oftentimes uh, not used the way that we we talk about it from a scholarly sense. When we're talking about it in, in terms of management research, um, oftentimes what we're talking about is uh, managing your emotions f- as part of your job for a wage, right? This is the, uh, you know, the, the you walk into, you know, the Arby's or the Chick-fil-A or whatever. Actually, I think Chick-fil-A is probably a really great example. You know, it's my pleasure to serve you, right? They say that every single time and they, they, they have to be... Uh, um, uh, happy when they do it. And those are what we call display rules. You know, the organization has these rules around um, how you should be presenting yourself. Uh, and, you know, there's nothing inherently wrong with that, uh, because who wants to walk into any restaurant and get treated by, you know, like a jerk um, or have somebody who's rude to you? You know, you, you wouldn't like that. Um, but, you know, what's What's helpful here, or, or the good thing to think about, and this comes from some great research, uh, an article from Alicia Grandy in um, the Academy of Management Journal, and we'll post a link to that as well, uh, where she studied some uh, people in the service industry, is you know people want an authentic, positive interaction. You know, we can oftentimes tell if somebody is just plastering on that smile, right? Um, <laughs> and, <laughs> and 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 actually, you know, we can. If you're the person who has to do the plastering on, that's what we call surface acting, right? Kind of the superficial level of, I'm going to pretend to be happy. You know, I'm going to go cry while I'm picking up the plate in the kitchen. But then when I take them out to uh, to the table, I'm going to be uh, smiling. That is really hard for people to um, do, uh, you know, day after day, to do that surface acting. Um, it, it, it can lead to a lot of stress. And so... Uh, it's actually better if they are deep acting, right? If they are saying, you know what, instead of just trying to act like I'm happy, I'm going to be happy for a little while. And and I do this sometimes when I'm teaching my classes. If I'm teaching a class in person, you know, or a synchronous online session, guess what? My students would probably never know it, but sometimes maybe I would rather be doing something else. I mean, that's just life, right? (laughs) Um, And, you know, maybe I'm not super excited about the material, but what I intentionally do, if if I'm feeling that way, which is actually fairly rare because I I really love the the topics that I teach, uh, you know, I will think to myself or I'll look myself in the mirror and say, look, Jack Wagon, professor, (laughs) if, (laughs) if you can't be excited about this, why on earth can you expect anyone else to be? And usually that little mantra can uh, make me actually feel more excited about the material. And that's deep acting. And then I, then I, then I get into the role, and it, and it works out just, just fine. And it's, it's not a stressful event for me. It's actually great, and, uh, and everyone benefits. So, you know, impression management can be helpful um, if it's done in an authentic way. But if you're trying to be someone completely different at work than you are elsewhere, this surface acting... Um, this inauthentic display of self, uh, it, it really can be exhausting. Right. And, you know, if you call up Dell for a computer, you know, odds are one of those call center guys is going to be like having relationship problems or something, mm-hmm. you know, a worse day, gastrointestinal distress, what, what, <laughs> whatever. <laughs> and then and you <laughs> you call up and they're like, Thank you for calling Dell Home Sales and Financing. And be- because they have, I worked at Dell briefly, um, selling computers out of a call center. Mm-hmm. And you, people who were calling in were excited to get a computer generally. You know, if you call that and you're like, yeah, thanks for calling Dell. Okay. You want a CD ROM? Yeah. They don't even do those anymore. But, um, you know, you <laughs> add people want to have you know they want an authentic positive interaction but everybody if you have to ask them has to know that sometimes that person that's serving you your burger who's taking your IT troubleshooting call any of that stuff might be having a bad day that day right right um and but 
but that's a whole thing about that interaction because they prefer you fake a positive moment than just be a curmudgeon on the on the phone. Right. 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 <laughs> that's right. So, you know, another related idea here, I think just has to do with how we think about our identities. And, you know, sometimes I'll come across people who um, they're, you know, they, they don't really have much of a personal identity. Their, their identity is so wrapped up in who they are professionally, uh, in terms of the workplace. And that's not necessarily a bad thing, uh, but it can, can kind of lead to some vulnerabilities, right? Um, because what happens if things don't go well at work, you know, or what happens if God forbid you're laid off or you're fired or you screw up at work? That can really be damaging if that is such a central part of who you are as a person. Uh, and, you know, it, it's funny because, you know, this is not really, um, you know, this is a fairly recent uh, human phenomenon, right? We um, didn't always work in organizations. We often, you know, the only organizations that really existed before the Industrial Revolution were, you know, big governments, some big religions and uh, militaries and stuff, right? Um, we didn't have these big organizations, and people didn't have this big professional identity. It was more of kind of social identity with your with your small groups um, and with your families. Uh, so, you know, I, I think it's important to remember: don't get too wrapped up in your professional identity. And and this is where I think actually having kids is really really helpful. Um, you know, it was funny. I, I was texting with um, someone who uh, is uh, a really great person in the Navy who uh, I work with, and. And she happens to be junior to me, and uh, you know, I, she's asking me a question, and I responded, and she responded, and she said, you're the boss, sir, and I, I responded, because I'm just kind of goofy, and I responded, and I said, can you please tell my children they're unaware? <laughs> you know, um, and you know, she's responded with some, you know, ha ha, right? Um, but, but it's funny, because I think sometimes, you know, children can keep you grounded in, in that type of stuff. You know, there's... So multiple Star Trek episodes in the different series where, you know, they all have this professional identity. They're going around exploring planets or whatever, and they get marooned on uh, a planet and maybe one or two or all of the crew. And and they have no idea if they'll ever be rescued. So they set about making their lives. Right. Mm -hmm. um, they build shelter. They start talking and they shift over. And I can see this on some social media where people talk about they'll react against, well, see, this is what society is, and we should just all be regular subsistent farming, living off the grid or <laughs> something. And at, at the base level, all this stuff is kind of baloney, right? Um, you know, what's you miss 10 meals, and then tell me if you care about moving up the corporate ladder, yeah. right? You know, that kind of Maslow hierarchy of mm. needs type things. And, you know, we get down to this base level and we find out who we are. And some people have been avoiding um, who they are. Right. And when you strip around like with this, you know, maybe being laid off 30 million, some odd people laid off, I think is what the numbers that are mm. at. And and you're at home and and you're stuck with yourself. And and you see people like, huh, well, I don't know, maybe I'll. FaceTime a college friend or family member. Maybe, maybe I'll bake bread. You know, <laughs> you're like, oh shoot, what do I do with myself? Like for me, I'm playing some guitar. You know, like I, I, I've got some things outside of work. And so, if your whole identity has been your work, you might want to take some time to develop those things in yourself and get in touch with those things that you really enjoy, um, so that if something does happen to your professional work. And that kind of life, which that volatility seems to be more the norm mm -hmm. now than it ever has been, um, that you're not just caught out, right? Right. And this is where I just think balance is really important. Um, you know, you, you have some other connections outside of work that are helpful for you to maintain that identity and maintain that connection uh, that you maybe you otherwise depended upon in the workplace, um, you know, and so uh, find that and use it. Uh, you know, some of what we're talking about here in terms of impression management, you know, it has to do with your identity, who you are, um, being, you know, more authentic, trying to close that gap between, uh, you know, who you present yourself as and who you authentically are. Um, but, w you know, a common thought that I have and a, a common criticism sometimes of some of this, um, 
this thought around like authentic leadership and being authentic is, you know, what if you are authentically a jerk and you just really have no empathy for other people, right? <laughs> oh my God. You know, I, these guys got to exist. I mean, sure. we have sociopaths and all that kind of stuff. And there's actually some interesting data from where people, um, you know, they're a sociopath or something, but they've adapted well to the, sure. or, you know, um, to performing those social interactions for other people. And they realize, you know, just being a cold, calculating jerk, even though that's who they are, that isn't the best thing to do. Mm -hmm. So they actually do curate a social response. Um, and that's not bad, you know? Um, the idea of being the you you want to be, mm -hmm. you know, that's, I think that could be really important. Yeah, yeah. You know, it, it, I think we should all, I, 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 I can't see a reason why it would be a bad idea <laughs> for all people to aspire to be something better, right? And to continually work in different ways, um, little ways, big ways, uh, on a daily basis to try to close that gap between um, who you currently are, how you currently behave, and what might be a little bit better. Right. So, so we've kind of gone through some of these, you know, th this is helpful, this is harmful. Mm -hmm. Um, now let's say you're on the outside. Let's say you've already got this dialed in. You got your good hobbies. You, you've gone on existential journeys to India <laughs> where you met some like, you know, shirtless guy on top of a mountain and <laughs> <laughs> right. You, you're dialed. They probably have those people in Utah, don't they? Yeah. I don't, I don't know. <laughs> <clears throat> maybe, maybe, <laughs> maybe, maybe it's you or one of your neighbors. I don't know. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah. And, and those guys probably have their own impression management. You know, your, your beard just isn't wispy enough for people <laughs> to pay money to see you on top of a mountain, but <laughs> you're, you need to work on your impression management. Yeah. Right. Um, but if you've already got all that stuff dialed, right. And you're interacting with somebody, you can miss out on a lot of value because you're looking at the cover of a book. Mm -hmm. This person doesn't look too corporate -y, or this person miss some social cues from our cultural norms. And it might give you a moment to pause and reflect, wait, is this a cultural norm or value that's helpful or harmful to our organization? Right. right. Are we missing out on all this value? Because, you know, if you're a startup with like five, 10, 40 people, you can probably curate the exact type of people that you want. But when you start to step up to the enterprise level and, you know, you talk to inter any enterprise level HR person, they're just like, Ugh. I mean, it becomes a bit of like a human sausage factory, right? Mm -hmm. You know, because you need a, th hey, go hire 20,000. Yeah. And well, you're not going to be able to get up to snuff and the, the uh, head count that you need and all that kind of stuff, having perfectly curated people right. across the board, you know? You're going to have some warts and, and bubbles on some of these. Uh, folks, well, and, right? and also I, I think sometimes we may be, um, you know, if, if it is all about impressions and if it's all about things like appearance, then we really can become biased, you know, and miss out on those things that actually matter for job performance. So I'm thinking in particular about when we're assessing people either formally or informally for promotion opportunities for hiring and so forth. Uh, and, uh, there's good evidence to suggest that, you know, we probably do the best job with those types of decisions if, for example, you know, we, we don't even know what the person looks like, like if, if it's a hiring situation, um, don't know what the person looks like, don't even know their names, because even the, you know, the um, the different names certain are sometimes associated with different ethnic groups and, and so forth. So not don't know their name, don't know what they look like just looking at their qualifications and so forth, kind of for that initial screen, um, because we oftentimes can have these biases um, that we maybe are aware of, maybe are not aware of. Uh, so, you know, be careful when it... Let's say that again. We've got these biases, yeah. right? Uh, uh, and, yeah. and and you got to just plan on them. So one, one of the things I think about is like the symphonies. They used to just be dominated by old white dudes mm -hmm. or whatever, right? White dudes of a certain age. And so they put a acoustically transparent scrim and a scrim is a kind of 
fabric that you can't see through, but that the sound can come through fine. Mm -hmm. And they started saying, cellist audition number five will now play. And that person would walk out and they'd wear gender neutral shoes. So you couldn't tell if it was high heels or, a mm -hmm. you know, flat or whatever, um, a loafer. And they would play and people would judge who got into that orchestra based on sound alone. Right. And then like very quickly after doing that, you got all kinds of ages, genders, um, ethnicities, and, and it diversified the orchestra because all they judged on was sound. Does this person rip on the violin? Yeah. You know, is this guy going to play or gal going to play awesomely here? And that was it. But so much, you know, when you write a description for, you know, HR says, oh, you want us to hire you a guy, right? Mm -hmm. Okay, send over the job description. Ah, that job description is crap. Send us over a good one. <laughs> Okay, fine. I can't just copy and paste it off the internet. Mm -hmm. So you go through, you you work with your team, you get a good job description. Nowhere have I ever seen it's like, I need a, a John who's about five, six <laughs> and wears these clothes. <laughs> I hope not. <laughs> but but that's the kind of bias you'll see right. when it comes time to actually interviewing, which which tells me this, right? If I am coaching an exec and I'm seeing that kind of stuff, as they're using these cultural cues as a shortcut to evaluate somebody's qualities that they're going to bring mm -hmm. to an organization rather than actually having a process to dig under the hood and find out whether this person would be right. 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 I mean, it, it, this even can go back to our example of, you know, when let's say, uh, you know, the, the colliding of professional and per personal personas with somebody running in behind the person on the zoom call. If you're a person who says, you know what, gosh, that was unprofessional. And that person needs, you know, I really think poorly of that person now, right? Does that actually have anything to do with their performance? That that would be the question that you really need to be asking. And um, you got to be careful with those types of biases. Yeah. So I, and in the army, it's, it's funny, you know, cause there's this kind of macho culture that I think, I don't know. It is what it is, but there's this group of guys called bronies. <laughs> have you heard of these guys? Man, it must be an army thing. I don't know. Yeah, I know. They're like, army dudes that like my little pony <laughs> no <laughs> yeah like some of these guys have tattoos of my little pony <laughs> that's <know>? so funny <laughs> and i mean and they're like more power to why, them. I don't, I don't know. why are you discriminating against us because we love my little pony right and you know some of these guys are like ripped and so like you probably wouldn't make a derogatory comment about their my little yeah. pony tattoo because they could probably stuff you in a garbage can type thing but but that's shattered. It's like me just saying it. There's probably people out there just like, what? Yeah. I thought these are the stone cold killers of the USA, you know, or something. <laughs> <laughs> and like, we got, we got everything. Listen, we've got like drama people. We've got an army band. We have IT workers that, you know, are working on securing our critical infrastructure from cyber attacks. Yeah. And we've got this whole gamut of people. Yet the curated image of the American soldier is this certain level of professional. Another place where I think that there's a gap is, I mean, we're both officers, Ben. We have different views on foreign policy and force strength and all that mm -hmm. kind of stuff because of our professional. But we tend to have those conversations as officers offline or in professional military journals. Right. And I seldom, seldom see. Now, with War on the Rocks, that blog, and a, and a few others, you'll see some of that leak out into the public, public sphere. Mm -hmm. But generally, it's that we're kind of a monolithic thought block. Right. And that's just not the case. And then I see this also in corporate cultures where everybody's a monolithic thought block. Um, you know, some of these IT tech recruiting companies, when they were getting off the ground, um, their image was that of mid-late 20s, super attractive, dresses on point. They couldn't drive too good of a vehicle, but I knew some of these um, firms had you know, you need to drive this kind of, you know, you can't get the Lamborghini because then our clients will feel like we're making too much money off them. Yeah. <laughs> but, but you need to have like a newer Camry. Okay. And mm -hmm. this was this idea. And then, oh, and your spouse or a significant other has to be attractive as well. Mm. And like, this is baloney guys. Uh, 
from a value perspective. Now, if you're curating that image, that's fine. But what they found is like they could only go so far. You can only hire so many thousands of people that look like they should be on People Magazine. Right, 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 right. And, you know, I think from a uh, an organizational perspective, this has to do a lot with the idea of inclusion, which I think is best defined. One of the best definitions I, I, I think uh, is out there is that, you know, inclusion is really about allowing for a simultaneous balance of uniqueness and belonging, um, allowing people to feel like they're part of the group, that they uh, have the, you know, this social fabric that exists within the organization upon which they can depend and at the same time, they are able to bring some of their true self, some of their uniqueness, some of their differences to work. Uh, and, you know, when we're thinking about this idea of navigating the professional and per- personal personas, um, having an inclusive environment is, is important. So if I were, you know, giving advice to a job seeker or someone who is thinking about how to plan out their career, look for those organizations where you can find that because it's going to help you flourish at work. Yeah, so I I live in Park City, Utah, and there's definitely some presentation from some Park City parents, right? <laughs> you know, you're out at the you know playground, and some of the parents, you know, can you believe she doesn't have them in chess club? You know, <laughs> <laughs> that kind. Of, and I'm always trying to poo poo on that kind of stuff. You're just like. Guys, I'm just glad my kids are alive at this point. Oh, my God. I think I have like crusty Cheerios on my shirt. Right. And and it's like, because let's be honest, that that stuff doesn't matter. No. And and so if you're a small organization, you're like, oh, we're going to I need everybody to be like me. You're not going to capture diversity of thought. That's right. And that if you're a manager thrust into a larger organization, your organization has such large staffing needs that you're not going to be able to get everybody's named John, they're five, nine with two and a half kids. And all you know, they're as cookie cutter as suburbia or the strip malls with a Best Buy Old Navy in them. <laughs> um, you know, you find those in every daggone town, every strip mall kind of looks the same, you know, that kind of homage, you know, how should I say it? Homogeneity, right? Homogeneity. Um, homogeneity. There you go. That kind of stuff is so boring and cookie cutter. And it leads to that thing where like the human is a cog mm-hmm. in the wheel, another brick in the wall type thing. And, and that's baloney. Um, but when we, the data shows, when you bring diversity, it's not just about being nice to a disenfranchised class of people, mm-hmm. right? This is about legit workplace advantage. And and capturing not only is it an advantage from your staffing and all that kind of stuff, but it's also from your business strategy, ideas, creativity and, you know, beating the next organization uh, to the punch in the marketplace. That's right. That's right. Yeah, I guess one final thing that we can talk about here with regard to how this is helpful and harmful in the workplace is uh, in terms of impression management and so forth is um, I think just it's important to uh, show empathy to other people. Right. Uh, and realize that managing impressions also includes knowing that it's not always the right time to say or tell someone exactly what you really are thinking and feeling at the moment. Uh, you know? <laughs> With the stuff that goes on in my brain, it's most of the time not the right time to say. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it, you know, what, what I like to say is, you know, just because you're thinking it doesn't mean you have to say it. Uh, you just and, and it's funny because I, I know some people who think, who kind of equate uh, saying what they feel all the time with integrity. And I, I don't think that that's really the case, right? They feel like if they don't say something that they're not, that they're being disingenuous to who they are or, or some, something like that. I don't think that's the case because, um, you know, as, as you like to say, and I think is really a, a really good way to think about it is that being honest without having compassion is cruel. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's, everybody's just trying to make their way. Yeah. Right. And nobody, very few people are like, you know, I'm just going to go into work and just do my worst effort. And th- and there's good data on why people start doing some of those sabotaging efforts. Mm-hmm. Sometimes it's a culture. Sometimes it's a whole host, host of things. But we all have different stuff going on under the hood of our brain. That's right. And we should be compassionate to each other. You're going to get more value out of people by not looking at the cover of the book. You're going to get more value for your organization and your teams by being inclusive, 
to a variety of people and types of behavior. You know, I worked on a software team where this guy liked to come in. He'd put on his headphones and put the blanket over his dual monitor set up in the back and would just code like a maniac. Mm -hmm. Now, now previous managers had had a problem with this because he was kind of shut off. But, you know, he may have been on the spectrum or something like that. Mm -hmm. You know, the autism spectrum. I mean, there's this whole variety. But that guy would churn out like two to three times the work that other people, <laughs> um, other developers were turning out. And this was a case where people just missed all the value there just because a little social awkwardness, which I don't, who gets to define what is socially awkward, um, you know, the socially awkward police, you know, <laughs> and because of his, his like dress code was a little, you know, off compared to what everybody else was doing. But the guy added so much value to that organization. So having empathy that people come from different backgrounds, different socioeconomic status, different all these kinds of things, and just focusing on, you know, the term I like to use is collaborative alliance. Mm -hmm. Hey, we're all from different backgrounds, but we're trying to achieve one goal, one mission, five goals, five missions, whatever it is. You can just get so much more. And empathy is what's got to guide that. Right. Right. So now why don't we move on and talk a little bit about some tips for how people can best navigate uh, between and among these private and professional personas. And one of the first things that I think is important is to be aware and be aware of what's around you. And that means reading those cultural cues that you see uh, around you and at work, maybe if you're in a new place, a new situation, uh, and doing so in a way that you're looking in, in, in terms of, you know, how are people presenting themselves? What seems to be working? What's not, what is appropriate and what's not, and how are people communicating with each other? Right. Um, how are they interacting? Because that can help you to better know how you should present yourself to be the most effective that you can be. Um, at the same time, you know, if, if, if you're in, if you're doing that, you're reading the cultural landscape and you're trying to figure out what's it like here. Uh, and you realize this is not, I, I couldn't do this, right? This is a, <laughs> this is a culture where I do <laughs> not fit. I could not be myself here. Um, probably not a good idea. Cause then you're going to be stuck in the situation of having to surface act, you know, kind of plaster on that happy face or whatever it is every day, or it, that organization, that culture is going to change you into someone who, whom you don't like anymore. And that's, that's a sad thing. Um, so I, I think for anyone who's seeking, um, you know, a career, looking at, uh, different job options, look around at the people who are working there, realize that, you know, it's probably more likely that you're going to become kind of like them than you're, than you're going to change them. Right. And, um, look towards finding some place where you can feel included. Right. Right. And, and that's, if you got that luxury, oh, well, you of know, course, yeah. with, with the changing economic cycles and all kinds of pandemics, all this kind of stuff. Sometimes you just got to take a daggone job yeah, because you need to eat, right? You know, eating's great. <laughs> um, yeah. And some of those, that's the idea of having an identity outside of work. Um, these are some of the lessons we can take from the LGBT community. So if you've got a place where you can be yourself, uh, you can kind of stretch out. That's not that place. It's maybe the right fit for you. Mm. Um you can get your identity and reflected sense of self and some of these items um, from, uh, you know, close friends, family, those kinds of network outside of work that can help you thrive in that work environment, even though it's not the best fit for you. Right. Um, there's a handshake, right? When you come into an organization um, and this is some of this is covered in this book called The First 90 Days, um, which we totally recommend to anybody that's making a transition in career or moving up, mm -hmm. that kind of stuff. Um, that when you cut, you know, everybody goes through the budget, the the justification, business case, all that kind of stuff for we need a new headcount. And then they go through a gauntlet of interviews. They take like six months to to fill that role. And then the minute that person comes in and starts making room for them, uh, for themselves, the organization starts rejecting them as a foreign body, yeah. right? The antibodies come up. It's like, wait a minute, did you just spend like six months, like selecting this person? Mm -hmm. um, there's a handshake between that individual 
and it takes about 90 days or so and the organization to kind of find that fit. The the individual adapts themselves to the organization, but it's never going to be a thousand times perfect fit, right? A thousand percent. And the organization makes adaptations to accepting that person because it's just not a perfect fit ever. There is no perfect fit. Um, so navigating that place is you're going to need to adapt and the organization's going to adapt. So you as an individual initially reading the cultural cues, you as a manager having a good cultural onboard and on-ramping thing for new employees can help ease some of that friction mm -hmm. that's bound to happen, even when it is a good fit between that individual and the org. That's right. That's right. You know, I think another thing to be mindful of as you're trying to navigate this dichotomy between your personal and your professional persona is realizing that, you know, impression management is important. It can be helpful in certain situations. You shouldn't just ignore it. Uh, at the same time, don't try to be someone you are not. You know, don't sacrifice your integrity um, because you're not going to be happy with yourself if you do. And it's going to lead to you being uh, less productive, um, less effective in that role. Yeah. And don't be deceived by the monkey suit. <laughs> so, you know, we always see, you know, I remember this IT recruiter. You know, I deal with those guys a lot. And, um, they're like, yeah, we know if we submit somebody with a British accent, they're just going to be hired. <laughs> <laughs> People just like, oh, we got to get one of those on our team. You they know? sound smart. It'll be fun. Yeah, yeah he sounds smart, right? Um, you know, consultants will come in and you're like, oh, my God, the corporates are here. Look, look at that suit. It's bespoke. Oh, my goodness. Those are real buttons, mm -hmm. you know. <laughs> I know this is a silly, silly yeah. stuff. But if that's what you use to assess somebody, mm -hmm. you got to be honest with yourself and be like, I need a different criteria to be, be able to hire. Well, I, you got to have a way to look beyond those superficial characteristics when evaluating others, their performance, you know, how are Yes. I'm hiring this person. No, I'm not all of those kinds of things you got. Don't be deceived by the cover of the book. That's right. Another thing to keep in mind is we just all need to remember that these challenges of being at home and the, the all the challenges of the home uh, really do impact work. And, you know, we can think about this from a, the aspect of people development, uh, you know, in the workplace. And actually, the military does a decent job with this because we realize very acutely, I think, that, hey, you know, <laughs> well, often, oftentimes we uproot people and we make them live in certain places and we say your family has to live here too and, and so forth. And we realize that, hey, we need to help these people not only be productive in the workplace um, in terms of knowing the specifics about their job, their knowledge, the skills that are related to what they're doing, but also we need to make sure that they are having healthy relationships at home. We need to you know, help them have the resources that they need in order to best take care of, of their kids and so forth um, and to manage stress and all those types of things to kind of um, help them be a, a productive whole person. Uh, and I think that's a really interesting idea. And I'm not necessarily saying that every organization needs to, you know, take care of every aspect of a person's life. But I think there is some value to realizing that people do have lives outside of work. And guess what? They interact with their work life. And so people development um, might not just be about work-related uh, items. Yeah. You think you got it bad with your personal life crashing uh, with your professional on a Zoom call. Imagine you and your whole family living in a neighborhood with your bosses and peer workers, <laughs> right? That's what happens on a military it base. Does. And so you go to the neighborhood pool. There's everybody I work with and their kids. Yep. You, you know, you go to the grocery store. Oh, look, look, it's the same folks. And, <laughs> and, but what that causes and what I've seen is a really cool adaptation of the organization. Mm -hmm. So somebody can say, you know, hey, ma'am or sir, I, I need I need to get a day off work. My kids been getting into fights at school. Mm -hmm. You know that your kids are at the same school with your coworkers kids and they may get in fist fights, and, you know, your spouse may want to divorce you. Oh, and they do divorce you. And now, you know. All that kind of met. I mean, this is the stuff that happens with people in real life. Right. And 
And in the military, you just got to get comfortable with it. If you're a manager, you still got to get the performance and your team needs to achieve goals. And they're having all this real life stuff goes. So you kind of learn about it. And there's resources. There's counseling resources. There's recreational resources. And you develop this empathy for people from a wide variety. You know, some of the people I was in basic training with, the first plane flight they had ever been on was the one to basic training. Wow. You know, all the way to we had a guy who was at the Twin Towers at 9-11 and was like a senior um, officer in the New York Fire Department. Mm. Um, that's a large gap. But then we all come together. And then because you're forced, because it's against the law for you to leave that job until your contract's over. <laughs> <laughs> It forces these really cool adaptations to where we see the individual and in their work and we encourage and help out with those things that are in their personal life that are in uh, impacting their professional work performance. That's right. That's right. And one last item that I think is important to keep in mind here is that, you know, as a leader, if you can have uh, a source of um, authenticity right with your with regards to your approach towards other people when that care for others that care for the organization and for the mission comes from an authentic place um and this doesn't mean that you're necessarily showing everything right uh, but it comes from an authentic place that can really be a source of strength when people believe you <laughs> because they know that that you actually believe the things that you're saying that can be amazingly powerful and useful for you as a leader and this has to do with a, a host of other items that we, we should address maybe in another podcast, but um, things like character and identity and values as a leader. Those things really matter um, because people will see them. Uh, and so having that type of authenticity is important. Uh, so just to recap, uh, what are, we talked about puncturing the perfect you here today on the podcast. So, <laughs> and, uh, so what, were, what were some things that we talked about today, Chris? Well, we still didn't talk about what I'm wearing, but um, <laughs> <laughs> and that's fine. <laughs> uh, well, what is a private versus professional persona? Mm -hmm. You know, that was really important when we kicked off. And how is this potentially helpful and potentially harmful in the workplace? And some tips for how to best navigate between the private and professional personas. That's right. I'll go put some pants on. <laughs> Thanks for listening to the Indigo Podcast. If you like this podcast, please consider helping us by rating us on Apple Podcasts or wherever you listen, telling your friends about us, having us on your podcast, or mentioning us on social media. Our website is www.indigopodcast.com, where you can access more information about us and this episode. Thanks again, and we look forward to talking with you again soon.